Welcome back to Just Blazor Programming, and as promised, this is a continuation of my last video on hacking a Blazor application, specifically a Blazor Wasm app. And today we're going to get into how to obfuscate your Blazor Wasm app using tools that are available to you online. After that, I will get into some of the caveats and stuff that you should know about obfuscating applications and the security of Wasm applications in general. And, you know, my thoughts on this, why I care so much about this. But before we do that, let's get to the practical stuff first and get into obfuscating the Wasm applications. So in this case, we're going to have a Blazor app, uh, a Wasm app, and I'm actually going to use the one that I used in my other video. And if you have not seen it, please go see it because I'm not really going to go into this in too much detail in this video about how to do it or how what to look for when you do the hack. I just assume you came from that video and you already know. If not, then please check out that video that I have somewhere on the top. So without further ado, this is a Blazor app, specifically the one that I used in that video. But all I really did was add a, uh, a class that got decompiled and I could see the information, specifically this one over here. All I did in this, and all you have to do if you have not gone to the video and you don't feel like doing it, is, op is create a Blazor Wasm app off of an ASP.NET hosted uh, with, an with the ASP.NET hosted checkbox there. And you'll have the same exact thing. The only difference is you will not have this class here because I made it up. And I, this is just to prove that when you decompile a class, which can be done very easily, especially because all the tools are free, you can see this. And if you don't think this is a bad thing, I think it is because in case you have keys in here, um, you know, if you have some sort of connectivity here that's shown and you think it's not being shown, it is. Or if you have some data that you don't want the client to have access to, then that could be a problem. Now, yes, it is true that this has existed for .NET like for basically all of .NET, but it does not make it less of an issue, especially if you want to keep uh, your your code proprietary, if you want to keep this with some level of security and knowledge that other people are not just going to easily get to this code. But without, but uh, in order for you to protect this code, in this video, we're going to go into obfuscation. Obfuscation being that your code, when it compiles, um, if someone tries to decompile it, they're not going to be able to see what is being decompiled. That doesn't mean that if they ha if they didn't have a dedicated team of people to decompile your code and understand what's going on there, they're not going to be able to do it. But this makes it a lot harder. And hopefully this, uh, you know, it's basically the lock the your car theory. You know, you lock your car. Sure, someone can break into it, but it's going to be a lot harder. And you've done your due diligence as much as you probably can. So in this case, I will look towards, not this one, this here. This is called esfuscator.net. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to obfuscation with .NET, I've looked into a bunch of tools and nearly all of them you need to pay for, including this one. But this one at least has a 30-day trial and it's actually a pretty simple setup. I'm going to show you how to do it with, um, with, uh, with the .NET. So all you have to do is download here. I already downloaded it. So I actually have ES obfuscator. I'm just going to go have it go here. So when you download it, just go to the normal download and then you'll have something like this pop out once this is uh, available to you. But before that, in your project, you need to do a few things. The first thing you want to do is go to your dependencies. And then you're going to add manage NuGet packages. And we're going to add that into our, our project. So you're going to see this, the uh, Gapachenko esfuscator.net. This is the, the same thing. And you want to install this. Yep. OK, good. So now we've installed the dependency in our project. Uh, it looks like it's done. Okay, good. So there's nothing else you need to do with the dependency right now. You're pretty much good to go. And what we're going to, and all it says that you need to do is have it in release mode. And then before you do a compilation, activate the application or activate the, uh, the dot exe. You can move this here for a second. You'll see what I'm about to do in a second, right here. And drag and drop whatever the uh, the the project files are gonna be. So this thing here, you just drag and drop it here. And you're done. 
So now this shared DLL is going to be obfuscated. So when I try to decompile it, it's going to be difficult to do, or at least it's going to be much, much harder to do than, than normal. And I'm going to use two tools to do it for the tool that I used in the other video and another tool that um, that is also available to you as well. Now, again, this particular tool does cost money if you want to use it for your applications. So I'll get into all that later about my opinion on obfuscation and whether or not you should do it for like every project or something. But, you know, for now, we're just going to assume that you have a use case to do this. And as you see, I've already um, obfuscated it. So all you got to do now, make sure it's in release mode and then run the app. So now we have our app. I wouldn't worry about this. This doesn't actually cause an issue for our application. If you go here, everything works just fine and you can still fetch the data like normal. And we're gonna now try to decompile that DLL, the dot shared DLL. If I go to inspect, go to network, first thing I want to do is you know, preserve the log is fine. Go to application and delete my cache and rerun it again. Go back to network and now we're going to try to find the DLL file. So uh, from the last one, I showed you how to do this whole thing, but what you need is Postman in order to get that DLL. So in this case, I'm looking for the shared uh, DLL because that's the one that I obfuscated and we're going to go through the same steps. You go right click, copy, copy link address, open the postman, make sure it's on get, paste this and then send and download. So I already have one here because I tried it already. So we're just going to call it response of obfuscated two. Oh, we've already downloaded it. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We don't need this for the moment. We could close that. So we're going to do the exact same thing we did in the other video, which is we're going to run our developer command prompt and run the Microsoft provided decompiler in order to run that. You need to get the command for it, which I, uh, or is it? I L D A S M. There it is. Yeah, I L D A S M. And this is the Microsoft provided decompiler. And wherever you saved your response, ours was response obfuscated to. We're going to drag that in here and see if we could decompile it. So, what happened here is that it's saying that it's protected and we cannot decompile it with this. Now, that's pretty nice. It's a good sign. But I'm not very comfortable with this. I do want to see what happens if someone tries to decompile it uh, using other tools. So I'm going to look for, you know, a, a reasonable tool out there that, that can do this. And one of the tools that I found is called JetBrains.pack. So let's go to that. So he, JetBrains is a company that makes a lot of tools. If you have been in the web development space long enough, you'll encounter JetBrains. Maybe you know them as the people who made Resharper. Um, if you... Like this one right here, I think it's probably the most well-known one, but they also have this dot, dot peak, which allows us to decompile and look into the code, which is what the other, uh, which is what ILDSM was supposed to do, but because it's protect, it's not going to even get into the process, but this can. Sorry for the odd uh, jump cut, but I was testing something out while I was doing this, and I saw that uh, the because we were using an internal within this connection string, the, 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 the obfuscator hides this completely. So it's like it's missing the file. But I wanted to show you what would happen if you had other kinds of file types in there. So I wanted you to actually see how the decompilation will look like. So instead, I added a new class to it called connection2. So all it is is just adding to one public and one private variable, each you know with their own uh, string. And then I recompiled it like we did it in a little bit earlier. And then I obfuscated it using the same tool. So the same steps were followed, except now I not only have two, but I have a third one as well. Just because I wanted to show you that I, I'm not like, you know, magic tricks here. The first thing I want to show you with this obfuscator, uh, the, you know, uh, the decompiler is an unobfuscated version of the code. So this is what I used back in the other video. Again, you haven't seen it, please see it. And this will show you 
uh, a version of our code that does not have that extra class, but the fact that you'll be able to see uh, the connection string here, um, just fine. You know, there's nothing that's obfuscated at all. You know, it's an internal class. You can see the fact that you can see whatever the value is going to be here. So this is completely open. If someone decides to grab your DLLs and decompile it with this, they'll be able to basically have everything they need to um, to see whatever it is that you wrote in there and how you wrote your code. So that was the unobfuscated version. So now I'm going to go to obfuscated version two, which is the one that we just obfuscated it completely starting from whenever I completed the last laser project without adding that extra class. So this is before I added the extra class. What you see here is that the internal is missing right now. Although you can still see these things here, uh, the summary, temperature, all that stuff. You can see the, uh, this is basically just the class here. But what you do not see is the actual internal class that is missing now. So, you, so internals are invisible if they're trying to get decompiled through this. So now let's see what happens when you have a public file that has a bunch of strings or whatever, maybe has a private in there. That's what the third one is for. The third one will match this one, the one with connection two as its class. Also, it has the same uh, other internal class that we had in there. So you see it's still missing. The internal class is still in our, in our code, aka the connection string one, but you just don't see it here either. This is the other version of it, but you see the connection to class, which is what I, uh, I wrote. But what you don't see are the actual values within them. You know, it's completely hidden. So if I go back here, the values of my connection to class are just Blazor public connection, just Blazor private connection. And obviously, you do not see any of that here. So it is obfuscated correctly with this. And it looked like it did not do any damage to my my um, my program. There is an error there when you do run this. Uh, but I don't think it's a big deal. Now, that is to, now this is just a very simple project. There isn't very much, you know, there's not many dependencies, not many complex things happening. I'm not going to tell you that doing this will completely, you know, will be completely bug free off the bat, but I will say that this is a step in the right direction. And if you're, if you're willing to go through that to obfuscate your code, then uh, I think there's also other options for you to use. If you buy the esfuscator.net, if I went to the website. I think it actually allows you to to toggle what kind of features you want in there. But what we have, what you're seeing there is basically the string encryption, which is what I cared about to hide your connection strings and whatnot. And, and this is one way of obfuscating your code using this tool. But again, this tool requires you to purchase it if you want to use it in production. And I believe the JetBrains tools as well at some point. A lot of these tools that do this do cost money. I've looked through a bunch of tools to see there's like a free one that you could use in production, but I don't, I don't, I haven't found any good ones. Um, this is the closest one to a good one that there is, but I will say that you don't need obfuscation for everything. So now this is going to be the, uh, the part of the, the part of the video where I try to explain whether or not you want to obfuscate or not. So let's just go into that. Boom. I'm back. So if there's anything else that I could really show you here apart from the obfuscation that you already saw. Now, my opinions on this, that if you are working for a company that wants to keep their code proprietary, AKA they don't want to show the code off to the world. They're trying to sell some software or some sort of, um, you know, subscription kind of deal or whatever, then maybe you want to consider obfuscation. Now there are caveats to it. Not all obfuscation tools are created equal and some of them can cause problems to your code, especially because of the reflection issue reflection being that you have your names of functions that you are expecting to find and use and obfuscation might change the names of those functions and that can cause problems in your code. That's one of the biggest things that I see when it comes to obfuscation. Now, in this case, it wasn't really that big of an issue because, um, I believe there wasn't much use for it. Like there wasn't really much use of the reflection stuff happening. And I think this particular tool handles it well enough that you won't discover it having a lot of problems, but I have not used it too much. I only use it really to te as, a, as a proof of concept to see if I could obfuscate Blazor, uh, Blazor Wasm project and still have it run normally. 
and I think I was able to. So it is possible to do so. I'm just not going to tell you that it's 100% foolproof. There's probably going to be some more work on your end to make sure that all the pieces work, especially if you have a very complex project. And if you are using obfuscation, then I hope you use it wisely in the sense that you need to use it because obfuscation does add a lot of bloat to your code. If I went back to uh, to this, this these are the obfuscated uh, code here. And you see that the unobfuscated version is not that different. It has maybe one class different. And it's only six kilobytes versus the obfuscated code, which is 16 kilobytes. So that's, you know, that's more than double what... Um, what's here so you are adding a lot more bloat to the uh to the pro program you're adding a, the payload is a little bit bigger now because you have this obfuscation going on so you might want to also take that into consideration when it comes to remember blazer wasm is a pay payload heavy um uh, it's a payload heavy um hosting option when it comes to blazer stuff so and it's one of the main, you know, gripes that I have with it and what most people usually have with it. But if you do need security, then I think obfuscation is a decent option. You're right. The obfuscation will not save you from, you know, hacking and stuff like that. That's, you know, that's other concepts that you need to understand how to organize your and architect your code. But it, what it will do is allow people to, you know, it's not going to be as easy to look into your code, what you're doing and the values inside your code. Yes, can it be dismantled and found out if you had like a team of people working on it? Can can it so can someone like actually go in there, figure out what you're doing, figure out the values and stuff? Yes, it is possible, but it's gonna be a way way harder. Um, and I think that's worth doing if your security is something that you is important to you. There are cases where you don't need to. There are cases where let's say you have a GitHub project, you don't care who who goes and learns the actual architecture of the GitHub project or what's written there because it's meant to be public. You have other considerations, other security considerations to um, uh, when it comes to it. But obfuscation is not going to be one of them because it's open to the public. This is just for the use cases where you want to try to save that code because it's not proprietary. It's not open to the public, which is a real thing. I've dealt with it before in other companies and when I used to work for, they used to sell software or they had some, you know, they had their own proprietary software they didn't want the whole world to know or whatever. And this is just something to consider, especially since .NET has always had the issue of DLLs being exposed whenever you work with them. Aside from that, um, you know, there's other security measures you can use, but this is, but then that all goes into, um, uh, you know, programming with security in mind. This is just an extra layer of security you can add to your application to obfuscate it. Because even JS obfuscation has its limits. JS obfuscation can be dismantled and decompiled, and then someone can look at your code in that way. But you do it because you want more security in it. So it's really the uh, so I think I think I don't know if I said it before in this video, but it really is just locking your door. You know, it's not. Is it the best defense mechanism against thieves and people who want to break into your car? Probably not. If someone wants to break into your car, they're gonna break into your car. There's nothing you can really do about it. But locking your door does give a deterrent it, it makes um, the opportunity much harder to take so that's how the way i look at uh, obfuscation it's not the end-all be-all of security it is just an extra tool in your toolbox to add more security to your application and as long as and you know what it sounds pretty uh pretty cool when you put it on your resume you know you put say hey i worked in obfuscating our code before it goes into production blah 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 all that good stuff you know People like to overlook the, these kinds of things. And in an interview, if someone you know says, hey, oh, you take the security considerations for whatever project you're doing, that's pretty good. That's a, it's a more advanced, high-level way of thinking of things. But again, obfuscation is a use case. So not all use cases are, are in need of obfuscation, especially if your project is already public, then obfuscation just gets in the way. Or if your project is pretty heavy, or if you just don't care because, um, you know, you have a service that you're, you're providing and most of what you're providing is going to be in the cloud or something like that. So it's not really the issue with your code. It's going to be more of the data problem, the, the data security. In this case, it's more of a code issue, especially if you have um, uh, some sort of connection string value in there, some sort of private key or something that you need inside the client for whatever reason. You want to keep that safe, then this is one way of doing it. Apart from that, you know, there's really nothing else in this video to, you know, to say other than that obfuscation can be used and you can obfuscate Blazor code. 
I encourage you to do it, especially if you are um, you're going to work for some client that needs proprietary code or whatever. But I also take into consideration the use case. Maybe you don't need to. It does add bloat and it's not 100% hack proof or whatever. But it is a step in the right direction. It is locking your door so that you can prevent thieves from coming in. It's not exactly the best solution, but it is, you know, a deterrent. Anyways, this is all I got for you today. This is a continuation of my last video. If you have not seen it, please see it. And please like, subscribe, comment, do whatever you got to do. And help me get up there. We're almost at 700, guys. Keep up the good work. See you later.